So welcome. In this next module, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Gary Friedman. Uh, I'm thrilled to have him here today. I've mentioned his name a few times in this course. He provided a number of the uh, examples that I've shared with you, and he's been a longtime champion of good writing in the medical literature. So uh, it's great to have him here today. He, was, uh, he has been an editor at the American Journal of Epidemiology for over two decades and was the director of the Division of Research at Kaiser Permanente Northern California for almost a decade and also is on the editorial board of a number of other journals and, and currently a consulting professor at Stanford. So I really appreciate you being here today, Gary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. So I'm going to just start by asking, uh, obviously we need to do good science, but besides good science, what are the, some of the key elements that journal editors are looking for when they get a paper? Well, one is novelty. Mm. That's, uh, we will often uh, reject a paper without even sending it out for peer review if it's just a repeat of findings that are already well known. I mean, if you're writing the 30th paper on alcohol and how alcohol is related to high blood pressure or obesity is related to mortality, um, don't expect people to be very enthusiastic <laughs> about it. Uh, so we will often reject a paper uh, right away on uh, novelty. And let me just tell you the process that we go through at the American Journal of Epidemiology. Uh, it first is looked at by the editor-in-chief, and then he assigns it to one of the other editors who really makes the final decision, and I happen to play that role uh, as a general epidemiology editor. There are other more specialized editors that work just in cancer or just in cardiovascular disease or just in infectious disease, but I tend to be more general. And uh, so if the two of us think that the paper is not going to be of sufficient priority uh, to be accepted, even if it's good science and well-reviewed, then uh, as a favor to the authors, we won't delay uh, a rejection of it. Another, uh, beside novelty, another criterion that we look at is uh, interest to the readers of this particular journal. Uh, for example, sometimes we'll get a paper that really is not so much an epidemiologic study, but a way to improve public health, and we will decide, you know, this is really more suitable to a, to a public health journal than to the American Journal of Epidemiology. Um, we uh, also look for good writing, um, and this can be especially a problem uh, with a non-English speaking author. Usually when a paper comes from a foreign country, often the English is really bad and we know it's going to need a lot of work, and we think it's a good study, we will often send it back and say, please have a, um, someone, a native English speaker go through this and edit it. And occasionally this comes uh, when a foreign uh, person who is, whose English, who is, uh, uh, lang uh, native language is not English it works in an American institution and uh, submits a paper. So, um, you know, usually that is not a problem, but it can be. Mm -hmm. Another uh, fact, factor is that, you know, don't make the paper too long, don't put in too much mm -hmm. excess material that's not needed. And another uh, important problem is what we call uh, slicing the salami too thin. Yes, yeah, that would be great for you to say a bit about uh, that. You know, if you <laughs> have a study that involves both men and women and want to try to get two papers out of it, say, here's, what this risk fa here's the effect of this risk factor in men, and then another paper, here's the effect of this risk factor in women, uh, that is really frowned upon by journals. And my own personal experience is that I was... Uh, I had to deal with this as an author. Uh, a colleague and I uh, each wrote a paper about health effects of cigar smoking. This was at Kaiser Permanente. His was on cardiovascular disease. Mine was on cancer. I submitted I, mine to the uh, Annals of Epidemiology. It was accepted. He submitted his to the New England Journal. Uh, it was accepted, but they they said, um, you know, do you have something on cancer? <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, naturally, he was younger and needed publications more than I did, so I, I sort of fell on my sword, <laughs> withdrew my paper from the uh, Annals of Epidemiology and, and combined it with his, and the New England Journal took it. Wow, yeah. So um, even I was faced with a salami problem as an author. So those are the, the yeah, main things. Yeah, sorting those things out yeah. early uh, can be very helpful. Um, and what do you think is, if you had to point to one thing, the number one mistake that scientists make when submitting their paper for publication? I think it's overconfidence in how important 
and uh, good their study is. <laughs> uh, you know, you've worked on it really hard, yeah. and uh, you've done your best to write it up, and you think, and this was a, a topic or a question that was really important to you, and you think, oh gosh, this is really an important finding, but uh, others may not value it so high. <laughs> so if it gets rejected uh, due to some factor like that, I would persist. I think it's important to persist and uh, submit it elsewhere, fix it and submit it elsewhere. Yeah, finding the right journal for it might be the might be the key. Right. Yeah. But you know, because you've devoted a year or two <laughs> to this project and you think it's really important, don't assume that other people will place it as high priority as you do. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. And I have to, of course, ask you to give some advice to authors about writing style because you've written a number of editorials in the American Journal of Epidemiology mm -hmm. dealing with writing. So, right. so what advice do you have in terms of the writing? Well, um, I guess clarity and, and conciseness are, are what I would put as the, uh, the highest priority characteristics of writing. Um, avoid repetition. Sometimes people will say something in the introduction and then repeat it in the discussion avoid that, uh, or they'll say something in the uh, methods section which gets repeated in results, so avoid repetition, avoid excess verbiage, yes. and uh, I've written editorials about that which I think you've used I've in used, your yes. teaching. Um, and um, avoid, you know, sometimes people will write a rather long discussion in the introduction of the paper where it's, it's really the introduction should be brief, say why you did the study and what, basically what you, what you tried to accomplish, but leave all the discussion, the review of the literature for the discussion section. Don't try to put too much in the introduction. Some things, are certainly you need some background uh, as to why you did the study, which may involve citing some previous literature, but don't go into it in detail if that's in the introduction. And, um, don't repeat numerical data in the text. You know, you'll have a table which has nice numerical data with odds ratios and so on, and then there's, in the results, you say, table one shows the blah, 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 and the odds ratio was this and that. Uh, so uh, avoid repeating that. We will often ask authors, you know, just describe the finding of the table in words, and they can see, the reader can see the numerical examples. Good, yeah. So those are my main suggestions. Those are good tips, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the, the fears, I think, that comes up often when I'm teaching a course like this and has already come up in this class is a lot of scientists will say to me, well, I, you know, I've been teaching them to write in simple and concise language, and they'll say, well, if I simplify it too much, I'm going to dumb down the science, it's going to lose precision. Mm -hmm. And so there's this kind of fear that a lot of scientists have. So I, I was hoping you could comment on that. <laughs> well, I, I don't think you'll necessarily dumb down the science uh, and we, of course, you do want precision and clarity, but um, I think you should avoid jargon and uh, things that are really hard to understand. Uh, George Comstock, who's no longer alive, but he was uh, used to be the editor in chief of the American Journal of Epidemiology, used to say that papers should be understandable by someone with a good college education or someone who reads the Scientific American. Uh, it does not have to be. Uh, full of uh, jargon that's only uh, understood by your your peers in your particular specialty. Yeah. So I would, uh, you know, we welcome things that are very readable and easy to read. I don't, I, I, I would not have that fear at all. Yeah, and uh, in terms of getting published, uh, when you get two papers in, let's say they were the same science and one was very jargony and, you know, sounds sort of the way <laughs> scientists think they have to write and you have one that's clear, can you comment on your chances of publication? <laughs> well, um, you know, if both of them get peer-reviewed and, and, and very highly rated and they seem, like imp they seem important to yeah. the editors, we might ask, you know, to please uh, explain what you mean by this word or this yeah, sentence. Yeah. So. Uh, it will take an extra step if it's really hard to understand yeah. and not clear to most readers. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what advice can you give specifically to first-time authors? I imagine a lot of uh, the students in this course have, are, you know, early in their career and haven't had a, a chance to get published yet or, or are in the process of submitting their first papers. Uh, uh, what bothers me most is when I get a paper 
uh, it'll often be from a really good institution and the senior author at the end of the list is someone who's well known but it's clear that it's been written by a student uh, <laughs> and uh, it sounds like a thesis it sounds like a PhD thesis or master's uh, thesis yeah. uh, which and it contains every conceivable strength of the study every conceivable weakness <laughs> so that to prove in writing the thesis that they learned what they were supposed to learn in the school of public health or in their graduate program. So uh, uh, write as if you were a more established uh, senior scientist who knows uh, what other scientists understand and you don't have to explain it, uh, uh, something to everything. I just happened to see a paper this morning in the uh, latest journal of the American Journal of Epidemi uh, latest issue of the American Journal of Epidemiology that uh, was going over the strengths and limitations of their study and it was a study about uh, mortality in, in uh, uh, whites and African Americans and uh, related to a certain factor and uh, I was saying one of the strengths of our study is that we had a large African American population as part of this study group. Well, that's it, sort of obvious. Or you, wouldn't, right, right. you wouldn't be writing about mortality <laughs> right, in them. Right. So you don't have to say that. I mean, yeah. things that are sort of obvious don't say, just say the important limitations of your study, the important strengths, um, and um, you don't have to label them as strengths and limit. It's sort of a jargon now in every epidemiologic paper, you have to find the word limitation or, <laughs> yes, you yes. know, just, just say what they are. Yeah, yeah, good. So, um, I guess, um, you, you know, I guess just avoid making your papers seem like a, a thesis. Yeah, I've encountered that as well yeah. in reviewing papers where you yeah. could tell that a somebody had taken the thesis and just yeah. tried to turn it into a paper. And it's a very different product. So right. paying attention to the to actually writing it like a paper, paper right. your thesis is a great tip. Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk a little bit about resubmission. So let's say that you are offered the opportunity, the, the paper's rejected, but you're mm -hmm. offered the opportunity to resubmit with a lot of comments from reviewers. Mm -hmm. What kinds of tips can you give people who are in that stage of the publication process? Well, first of all, although acceptance of the revision is not, a, is not guaranteed, and that will say so in the yeah. letter, I think you should take that as, as encouraging. The yeah. fact that it got past that first reviewing stage is really a good sign and you should uh, work hard uh, to improve the paper so that it will get accepted. Yeah. And um, the um, first of all, either whatever the, uh, you know, first of all, list each comment that the uh, reviewers make and respond to that. It makes it much easier as an editor to, to, to be able to see that the author took into account every comment that, either, that both reviewers or as many reviewers who are involved made and, and the editor will often uh, make comments too and list them and respond to each one separately. And um, either whatever the comment says, either fix it, fix what the problem is or explain why you, you don't think that that criticism is, is valid or important, explain why you don't want to fix it and make, you know, give a good argument for that. Um, show, uh, and also please show the editor where you made the changes in the manuscript. They'll, you know, if someone says, well, I just uh, changed the, the method section to reflect this, uh, that's sort of hard for us to find what exactly you did. So either highlight the change, list the changes in when you respond to the comments, either highlight them in the manuscript, say, you know, say where they occur, highlight them, or use track changes, supply, in addition to the uh, version where you get rid of the track changes, also provide the version that has the track changes so that the editor can see exactly what you did. Yeah. Or sometimes, sometimes the paper will be sent out for uh, further review, further peer review. Sometimes the peer reviewers have really mm -hmm. strong concerns and I, as an editor, will say, will send it back to them and say, did, did the author really uh, satisfy your concerns about this? Um, and um, be polite. 
<laughs> you know, he had that, 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 oh, this, this reviewer is stupid, you, you know, uh, he didn't really understand. You say, oh, we thank the reviewers for yes, their, yeah. their constructive criticisms. I'm sure, you know, the paper has improved as a result right, right. of this. So, you know, that, that does not hurt. It's yeah. everybody's yeah. instinct, I think, yeah. to at first be a little defensive when you get your review back. So have, you have yeah. to go back and yeah. tweak the language a little bit to right. make sure you're yeah, right. being polite. That's a good tip, yeah. And um, can you give some words of encouragement for young scientists who might have uh, submitted their first paper and actually got an outright rejection? Uh, can you, uh, what, what are some words of encouragement? <laughs> well, um, I would just say fix it, and uh, if it's totally rejected by that journal, they're not asking for a resubmission, fix it, try to respond to the reviewer's comments that you feel are justified, and submit it elsewhere, and persist. I've had, my, as an author, I've had to submit uh, papers to as many as four journals till it finally got accepted. Mm -hmm. So um, I think persistence is important. Uh, don't take the rejection personally. Uh, it's hard not to, and I, I <laughs> sometimes do, but you realize that some reviewers may not uh, be very competent, may not really understand what you're doing. Uh, this will often happen if you submit an epidemiologic paper and it gets reviewed by a clinician who does not really understand mm -hmm. uh, principles of epidemiology. They'll feel that if you write a paper about stroke, if, if every case was not reviewed by a neurologist, then it's not a valid right. paper. Right. So, um, or, or maybe they're competent, but they just had a bad day <laughs> and, uh, and didn't really pay close attention to what you wrote and missed some passages that really would have answered their question. So just realize that reviewers are human. Uh, just like you, just like authors, and uh, yeah. and uh, that's just the way the system works. Yeah, yeah. It's not perfect. And then talking about the system a little bit, um, you know, what changes uh, do you anticipate are going to occur in the publication process? There's a kind of a lot going on now with the online and open access. Right. Can you say a little bit about what's going to happen for <laughs> in the future. Well, I think you, you've <laughs> described it. <laughs> you know, more less paper, more electronic. Uh, <laughs> publications, it'll appear faster, you know, like yeah, EPUB yeah. before before right. it appears in the paper version. Uh, there will be more new journals. I keep getting uh, emails from journals that just started up, you know, and they'll make it sound like it's your field, and uh, there's probably not such great peer review with them. They want to establish, they want to get some uh, known authors and publish, mm -hmm. uh, but the, um, I've had a paper you know, which was submitted to a journal that's supposed to be peer-reviewed, and it, and the acceptance came back in about five days. You know, <laughs> so I don't think it was really right. uh, peer-reviewed. Uh, I, I, of course, you know, I'm biased, but I thought it was a decent paper, and but I don't think it got the kind of peer review that. Uh, papers normally get from good journals. Do you think peer reviews are going to be going to change then somewhat in the future because of this proliferation of online journals? Um, say that again. Uh, uh, do you think that the peer review process itself is going to change somewhat because of the proliferation of online journals? Uh, well, it shouldn't, um, <laughs> but it it might. Uh, I'm not sure how. Yeah, I don't know. You know, if they're really in a hurry to publish, uh, they might say, you know, get your review back in a week, or you know, yeah. and, and a lot of people just can't, can't do that. Fast, yeah. There uh, was another point I want to make that uh, now. Um, NIH has a policy that if uh, your paper is supported by them as part of a grant or contract, um, the Finnish man, even if the journal wants to charge money for uh, downloading the paper, w after a year, uh, NIH will put it on PubMed right. as a Finnish manuscript, which may not have had the kind of uh, copy editing that will finally mm. uh, appear in the journal. but it'll at least be your final version of the manuscript. And so uh, you'll be able to, to read papers that have been out for a year, even if, for no cost, even if the journal is the kind that wants to charge money yeah, for that's it. that's great, yeah. And if you could change one thing about the publication process, what would what would you change? <laughs> uh, well, I had I, I when you asked me that or question before, I got two, two, I got two, two things. Is fine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I, I think there should be greater valuation of negative findings mm -hmm. by both researchers and by um, the journals. Uh, you know, 
you're going when you do studies, you're going to have this great idea uh, that you think something is a cause or prevention of of some disease, and you're going to do a study, and it's not going to pan out. That is the that is the most common experience uh, that we epidemiologists have. In fact, uh, I now have a graduate student here who is doing a study of uh, metformin in relation to risk of breast cancer because there was some thought that this might be a preventive um, agent for uh, you know reducing the risk of certain kinds of breast cancer and um, this is being done at, at Kaiser Permanente in our division of research but um, it's looking like and, and this is not the final result but it's looking like that's probably not going to turn up what was hoped for or what was expected and naturally the uh, researcher is very disappointed in that but you know I say you know this is important to know too that there's a negative finding so uh, don't be uh, discouraged if you have a negative finding it's important that that get published and it's and I wish journals would be more interested in, in publishing these and sometimes you know a negative finding if you want to get it out there it could be written in the form of a brief report which yeah. will take less journal space it'll get higher priority so uh, I think that's that is my main answer to your question okay. I um, I also wish that there was greater ease in getting peer reviewers to review a paper sometimes well, we have a list at the American Journal of Epidemiology, and uh, I send a particular paper out to people who said this was their specialty or special interest. And out of ten people who we send it to, only one agreed to review. And oh, wow. we we try to get two. And I was asked, you know, can you make a decision on just the one review because we can't get, keep trying to get reviewers. So, as as a scientist and an author, please. Uh, accept the responsibility of being a reviewer as well as a um, as an author and we've had some uh, cases where you know we've published papers by a certain author and this author consistently refused to review papers and naturally they're not well regarded by the mm -hmm. editorial <laughs> staff so those are those would be my two concerns yeah that's that a good uh, good point a good tip to, and, and the opportunity to review is a good way to learn also Absol as an author so, absolutely yeah, yeah. Great. Is there any uh, parting uh, thoughts or tips that you want to offer to the class? No, I think we've covered. Oh, uh, okay. you, your questions are so your questions <laughs> are so good that you've covered everything that I might want great. to say. Thank you so much for for taking the time to speak with us, uh, oh, Gary. You're very much. welcome. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.